going to begin uh, talking about this conflict of two natures, verse 14 through 25. And I'm reading from the New American Standard. It says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am flesh, sold into the bondage of sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I am not practicing, what I do not like to do. But I am doing the very thing that I hate. Mm -hmm. But if I'm doing this very thing that I do not want to, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but it is sin that dwells in me. For I know there is nothing good that dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want to do, I do not do it. But I practice the very evil that I do not want. But I am doing the very thing that I do not want. I am no longer the one doing it, but the sin that dwells in me. I find in this principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. But I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the members of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members O wretched man that I am who will set me free from this bondage of death thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord so then on the one hand I myself with the mind am serving the law of God but on the other hand with the flesh, I am served in the law of sin. Father, thank you for your written word. Uh, we need your rhema word to help explain this to us. So let it be clear to us as we leave here today the battle that we're in. And we give you the praise and all the glory in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So as we begin to look at this, we're going to explore this battle that's within our own minds that's raging. And really, this is the mother of all wars. When we think about what's happening between our ears, it is something that we cannot run away from. The general theme of Romans 7 is basically there are two things. The believer's relationship to the law and the utter failure of the law to sanctify us. The law basically only shows us our iniquities. It can't do anything to help us beyond those iniquities. Secondly, understanding that the law is not sin, that the law is good because it reveals sin to us. It is the mirror in which our souls can reflect who we are. Sin corrupts the commandment of law. Romans 7 is practical, spiritual. It is a real view of how sin dwells within the believer. However, the death of Christ is the only freedom from this bondage. This war that rages with us. World War I is deemed to be the war of all wars. It's called the Great War. There were over 33 countries involved in this war. This war was different because it was the first time that man amassed tanks that could move across the land at lightning quick speed. It was the first time that they used airplanes to bomb and raid. It was the first time they found out that chemical weapons could wipe out a colony. All of those were used. 33 countries, 10 million people killed, soldiers killed. 7 million civilians killed in World War I. The powers to be got together, they formed the League of Nations, and they determined that at this point there should be no more war. They, uh, they did uh, abolish chemical warfare because they saw the utter destruction of chemical warfare. But it wasn't that long later that there was World War II, those kind of things. So when you look at what happened in World War I, there were laws and rules associated with how countries would govern. But the Austrian-Hungarian structure said we were going to do this type of law, where the Serbians wanted freedom. But there were laws there. The question was, what do we do with abiding by those laws? 
giving in to those laws because they're real. I would like to suggest to us that we have even a bigger internal battle that happens between our ears that probably pales in comparison to all of the wars that's happening as the wars that's happening inside of the human mind. Some of us are very conscious of those wars and some of us aren't. It's a great danger to not to be conscious of what's happening between our ears. Why? Because there are rules and circumstances that are set forth. Almost in the song that says there is no condemnation, we have to really understand what that is. So when we begin to explore this, we want to look at three things, looking at this battle within. We want to first start out by saying, what is this law? What kind of law is that we are to obey? And then secondly, how can sin indwell Christians? Uh, if we're supposedly free from that, how can it be within us? And then thirdly, how do we free ourselves from this giant of a mammoth called sin? So when we look at law and we begin to define what is law, we find that it is really defined from Nemo. And it is to parcel out something. Uh, the Greeks used it in such a way that it was to set rules and regulations on how things should be. And then we see in the New Testament it's used over 193 times. It's defined as that which is assigned, hence usage. It's a rule producing a state approved by God. It's a precept or a guideline, an injunction, things prescribed by a divine order or divine will. The Ten Commandments is such a thing for us. We see that very clearly. And in fact, if we look at Romans 7, verse 7, Paul tells us, he helps us to define this law. He says, what shall I say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to no sin except by this law. For I would not have known what coveting if the law had not said it to me, thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me covetedness of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. So what are we saying? Paul is saying we have laws and guidelines set up by God. I don't care who you are, Christian or non-Christian, the Ten Commandments are the laws of God. Now we can choose one or two things. We can choose to say, I'm going to live by Christ. Oh, I want to be judged by the Ten Commandments on that day. But they're there. Paul is saying that they're not bad. He said, I wouldn't have known what covetousness is if the law hadn't bought it to me. Then when the law showed it to me, man, I was coveting of all sorts of things. So God says, I want you to be pure. I want you to know who I am because I am holy. And you can take it a step further. The Ten Commandments are so holy, it's equal to who God is. So when we said do not covet, do not commit adultery, it's not just the act, it's the thought in the head. So God is like, I'm serious about who I am and what I expect of my people. So what can we conclude from this? We can conclude a couple of things, and that is that the law is from God, and its purpose has been given so that we can see ourselves as measured against a holy God. We can see ourselves. It also allows us to see ourselves through the lens of holiness. So this, this law thing is something that God says, I want, this is what I expect of you. This is what I'm going to hold you to the standard of. So how do you and I get there? So this war that's in my mind, Paul says, is now beginning to come clear. I didn't know what covetedness was. Now that I know what God's expect of it, I am doing it all over the place. So then when we look at how does sin indwell us, which really gets us to our, our message, our passage today. So join me as we look at this passage by passage. Romans 7 verse 14. It says this. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am flesh. 
sold into the bondage of sin. You know what? Sin is imputed in us. Isn't it? He says, for what I am doing, I don't even understand it. I am not practicing that which I like to do, but I am doing the very thing that I hate. How do we know that sin is imputed in us? It's imputed into our flesh. Our desire is to do those things that are, catch this, antithetical to God. Our desire is to do those things that God hates. We know that because we can see that in children. We can see that in little children, things that we don't have to teach them to do that is opposite of what we want them to do. In fact, in uh, Proverbs 22, 15, it says that in a child's heart, foolishness is wound up in him. But the rod of discipline will drive it far from him. So look, you didn't have to teach your kid to hit another little Johnny to hit little David. Yeah, why did you hit little David? I don't know. <laughs> but they do it, right? You don't have to. Did you get that cookie out of there? No, I didn't do it. You know, that is just there. It's imputed in us. God wants us to know that hey, we got to deal with this thing that He hates. So when we look at verse sixteen, it says. I am doing the very thing that I do not want to do. Therefore, look, I agree with the law. I'm confessing that the law is good. That is good that he said that. He says, what God sees and has laid down is right. I can see that as being right. And you know what? I'm wrong. Many of us take the opportunity to think about things in a way that is only on a top level. But we, when we begin to break it down, we begin to see ourselves in ways we hadn't seen before. If I begin to think that Larry is doing pretty good, has a pretty good uh, prayer life and doing those things that's right, but when I stop to examine myself every day against the Holy God, I see filth and ugliness. I see opportunities being squandered. I see me being scared to talk to people at the grocery store, being nudged. I just see all kinds of things, passing people and should have helped them. It's just stuff that's in us. That we have to ask ourselves a question. What is preventing me from being sold out to God? I am so focused on my job, my school, and all of this other stuff. And when I am like that, not that it's not good. It's the question then, what's happening then to God? When I don't have God present, what's happening to him when he's not present in my life? Paul will again continue to tell us. He says, for well, I know that nothing good dwells in me. I mean, that's a, that's a stance to take, isn't it? When I look at myself and I go, man, there is nothing good that lies in there. You and I can get up in the morning and we look in the mirror. And if you're like me, what you see doesn't look too good. It needs help. But that's what the law of God does to us. When we take that law and we look at it, we're looking at a mirror and we go, oh my God, what I'm seeing, I don't like when I look at it. But we really have to understand it from the perspective of God. So he goes on in verse 9, he says, for the good that I want to do, I, I do not do. I practice the very evil that I don't want. But verse 20, it says, but I am doing the very thing I do not want. I am no longer doing it, but the sin that dwells in me. So here's a point. Paul is saying, and if we're not careful, we can take this the wrong way. It's not me that's doing it. It's this sin thing in my nature that's causing me to do it. Well, that's really not what he's saying. I mean, that's a cop-out because it is me. If I tell you an outright liar and I just saying, well, you know, I don't really like to lie. I didn't want to lie. I wasn't intended to lie. I just lied. It wasn't me. No, it's you. Part of the problem with our society today is that we want to move and push personal responsibility for people. We want to find excuses why people, even people that go and shoot up people. We want to find, well, where's his background? Really, what, all these other things that cause this person to do it? No, you did it. You know, we, we have to set up and we have to accept those things and we have to hold people accountable 
for doing those things that are wrong. Then verse 21 he says, hey, then I come to this principle, Paul says. <coughs> hey, evil is present in me. And some versions say, even when I would do good, evil is always present in our be. Even when we want to do good, evil is all around us. Even when we do good, there's something about our nature and things that's calling us away from God. He says in verse 22, I joyfully concur with the law of God in this inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the members of my mind, making me a prisoner to the law of sin, which is in my members. He says, in my mind, I have this stuff that I'm wrestling with. Are we wrestling with stuff like we should be? I mean, there's things that are going on. Do we examine the things that we do and say to people? How we act? I went to breakfast with a guy on Monday. And God was just um, nudging me. To, there was these two sort of elderly women, African-American women, and he was telling me, to buy their breakfast. And I'm I'm fighting it. Because I'm talking about this guy. We're getting ready to leave. I get up to the counter, getting ready to pay for breakfast. I couldn't leave. I had to go back to those ladies and say, uh, give me your check. And really, that's what that's all I said. Give me my check. And lady goes, stop. She says, Who are you? I said, I'm just someone wanted to buy. She said, No, you're from God. Because we need to hear a word from you. We need a blessing. <clears throat> and I'm like, I was almost out the door. <laughs> but I, I couldn't get out the door. But I tell you what, if I'm honest with myself, I have been out the door before. I left it right there. Because I was in a hurry. And the guy there that I was with, he said, man, that was inspirational to me. So God's just working all of this stuff around. Mm -hmm. Only if we just listen to it, yes. right? And then act. So there is war that's going on in our minds. And it's going on all the time. And it is the mother of all wars and it doesn't leave. Just as soon as you and I think that we've overcome one hurdle, there's another one in front of us. And we'll find out why in a minute. But that is the reason why, because we know from 1 John 5, that all unrighteousness is sin. Unrighteousness is doing anything that is a part or antithetical to God. It's just sin. And we battle it all the time. So what can we conclude? I think we conclude here that we have been imputed with sin from our flesh. Sin entered us through the fall of Adam. It's just there. But what I like is the next section. How do we get free from this? How do we get free? And it goes back to the song we were singing by Anthony. So look at Romans 8.1. So Paul says, I have this problem. I'm sin. When I look at what a holy God wants of me, there is no way that I can fulfill it. The very thing that I want to do that is evil is the very thing I end up doing. My whole body, Paul says, is corrupt. Who can save me, he says, from this law, flesh of sin? Who can save me? Then he says, therefore, verse 8, 1, there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. We're not condemned. If we know Christ Jesus, we're not condemned. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ, Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. All of us who claim Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior has been set free from death. Paul talks about this. Well, let's look at verse uh, three first. For the law could not do, uh, weak as it is through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as in a sin offering. He condemned sin to flesh so that the requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us, we do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. He gives us a great analogy. 
in 7, um, 2. Flip back over there because it talks about a married woman. They were asking him about who has jurisdiction over this woman. In verse 2 it says, For the married woman is bound by the law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning her husband. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she has joined another man. What God is telling you and I is, we accept Jesus Christ, we're dead to sin. There's no condemnation anymore in us. Sin. And he goes up, shall we keep on sinning knowing that? No. But we are free from sin. So this battle that goes in our mind, for what purpose? So that we can be sanctified. We'll get to that then. Verse 5 says, for those who are called, who are according to the flesh, they set their minds on the flesh. But those according to the spirit, things of the spirit. For the mind of the flesh is death, but the mind that set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on flesh, on the flesh is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God. For it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but you are in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, through the, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness that we talked earlier. God has imputed righteousness in us. Now here's the big question. If I'm sinning and I keep on sinning, the question I have to ask is, is righteousness imputed in me? I got to ask that. If I keep sinning and I'm liking it or I justify it, I have to ask, am I his. Because if I'm his, can I keep on disappointing him by doing those things which I hate? Paul says it's not that you're not going to stop doing those things which are ungodly, but we're going to recognize those things which is ungodly because what God does is once he's justified us, the problem of being sanctified is up to us and him. I've got to recognize the fact that this thing that I'm doing is evil. That's what the law does for us. It gives us that mirror, that opportunity to reflect at us that what I am doing is not pleasing to God. When I do that then, I can back up, repent, and move forward toward Christ. So there, there's a war going on. The question is, am I pleased with this war? Which side am I taking? If I'm saved, I can't take but one side. So what can we conclude here? We can look at this and we thanks be to Jesus that we're no longer living according to the flesh. It's dead. It died with Christ. But look at this. 8, 12 through 15. 8, 12 through 15. It says, for there is no distinction between Jew nor Greek. 8, 15. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as the son we cry out of the father. Well, I want to back up to 12. Back up. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For we are living, a, for if we are living according to the flesh, you must die, he says. But live by the spirit. If you live by the Spirit, you are put into death the deeds of the body that you live by. Verse 14, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of slavery leaving to fear again, but you received the spirit of adoptions of the Son, which we require our, our Father. If we are, we have been transformed. We have been saved. We are now looking at how do we become sanctified? Sanctification is a process where we work out to become more like Christ. You know what the law does for us as Christians now? It points out our next step to being sanctified. I get this one thing fixed and go, okay, God, I feel good. I got that. 
I'm not cursing anymore. I got it. I thank you. I move on. And then God goes, boom. You're taking pins from the office. You steal it. <laughs> God, I didn't know that. Well, that's what the mirror is for. Mm -hmm. Fix it. But if we're stuck over here and can't move forward, our sanctification process is being slow. So what can we conclude here? We conclude this. The righteousness of God has been imputed in us. Sin is dead. That's why in 1 John says that we can't sin anymore. Not those that are truly in God. I mean, the act can happen, but you and I is brought to our remembrance that this one that I'm sinning is not good and not of God. We repent. And we do it as quick as we can. So righteousness is imputed. God has justified us. Justification has happened. Because he is just, and he's the only one that can say, you and I are justified. He's justified in making us righteous, is what it says. God is. Now, sanctification involves us exercising the Holy Spirit. When he brings those things to us that we're not doing well, we need to do that. So what wars could be going on? I mean, we could be gossipers. We could be uh, selfish people. We could be all of these things that we have to examine. It doesn't have to be the Ten Commandments. It's those things. There's somebody that I don't like and I don't speak to. It could be a lot of things. The way I drive, how fast I drive, cutting off. It could be all of those things that God should be bringing to us because it's a part of our sanctification, getting us more and more like Christ. So what does this mean to be totally committed to God? Well, first it means staying in his word more than out of it. Staying in God's word more than being out of it. It also means being mindful what is entering through our eye gates and ear gates. What are we taking in? You know, I heard a lot of young people say that, hey, I can listen to this rap music and it doesn't bother me. That's not true. I mean, what I take, I can look at this little girly magazine or whatever. That's not true. And it doesn't bother, it bothers us. We have to be conscious of what we're taking in. And if it's not of God, I want to suggest, brothers and sisters, that we get rid of it. Paul said we pray without ceasing and not putting too much emphasis on ourselves, but rather God and others. You know, we are born with a myopic view of things, how we look at ourselves and what we want for ourselves. And I'm hurting and I'm discontent and I'm mad and you did this to me. Be nice if we just let some of that go. If you and I find a way and we learn ways to be more in tune to people and less in tune to ourselves, let people hurt us if it's for the sake of Christ. It's okay. It's a part of our sanctification. It's probably one word that we don't use and talk about enough, and that's being sanctified. The process of being more like Christ. And it hurts. And the battle that goes on in our minds will become even more evident.